السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد Brothers and sisters, welcome to our weekly program Friday Night Live. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us in the company of the righteous in this world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raise us amongst the righteous on the day of Qiyamah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fill our lives with mercy and rahmah as all of us are in the need of the rahmah and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So alhamdulillah, uh, every week we get this opportunity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to sp- spend some time, few moments together uh, where we can, alhamdulillah, have some of your questions and your comment come to us, a look that, you know, through them, through the Quran and the Sunnah and try to answer as many as we can. So please feel free to write your questions and your comments, inshallah, uh, in the section, uh, in the comment section, we'll be able to uh, take them, inshallah, uh, as, as many as we can. And, uh, you know, being the, the beginning of the month of Rajab, uh, which is one of the sacred months in Islam, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his uh, farewell khutbah, or the hajj sermon that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam delivered, the Nabi of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, and he said in his khutbah or statement that, O oh people, the time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created has come to, to where it began from the beginning of the heavens and the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for us 12 months and within them four are sacred. Uh, amongst the sacred months are Dhul Qada, Dhul Hijjah, Muharram. And this month, which is the seventh month in Islam known as the month of Rajab. So we are currently in a sacred month known as the month of Rajab, uh, which also marks the two month uh, period towards the beginning of the month of Ramadan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us accept it and allow us to do what is correct uh, and right in our lives inshallah so let's tr- take some questions brother kevin assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh uh, sister yusra uh, azaz asks wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh what is the ruling on music music in islam in terms of listening to it making it and making money off of it how do we deal with other muslims who follow different opinions on muslim when in a social gathering and in general uh jazakumullah khairan for your very very important question very very important question subhanallah so with regards to music uh in general rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam's you know famous hadith where the nabi of allah sallallahu said arritsu mazamir ash-shaytan that the instruments of music are the tools of shaitan. This is an open hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Hadith Rasulullah That instruments of music are the tools of shaitan. And the Quran itself in many places have mentioned the word lahu al hadith uh, and the commentary of, of of many commentators of the Quran and mufassirin have mentioned that the word lahu al hadith in many of the context of the mufassirun or commentators have referred to music itself so we find direct rulings from the verses of the Quran from the prophetic life and the tradition of the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the prohibition of music itself uh, in terms of listening. Yes, if there is poetic saying, if there is poetry, uh, or if there are words that really uh, can uh, create a sense of goodness in the lives of others, such as hamd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the praise of Allah, or anashid, 
nasheed, which refers to the praise of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or just general lyrics or words that really inspire the hearts of individuals to do the right thing. That is definitely acceptable. Hassan ibn Sabit, anhu, the great companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was known as one of the greatest sha'ir the poets of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So such poet, poetry and such lyrics was used that, that used to define the praise of Allah, the praise of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and of course to, inst to instill within the lives of companions great actions and good deeds. So that is something that we find from the lives of the companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But with regards to uh, musical instruments and music which has uh, you know, immodest words and words that are not appropriate or things that will instill or, or uh, you know, create within individuals, people, or society immoral actions or will create within them actions that are not appropriate, subhanAllah. Uh, those are completely not acceptable uh, in our deen, in our religion. Uh, yes, some may say that we find certain traditions in the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, where Ummul Mu'mineen, uh, you know, Aisha radiallahu anha was traveling with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they saw a group of, of people playing some instruments, and she stood with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the Nabi of Allah sallallahu was with her, and they take this as a base on making the entire thing halal and permissible, not looking at all the other perspectives itself. And it was a very rare condition and specific moment and cer specific circumstances. And even the instruments that were used were completely different. So when generally and making it in, in a very simple uh, <coughs> uh, and just making it very simple and easy to, to understand, that when it comes to musical instruments, uh, making it and making money off of it, anything that is impermissible for us to consume and do ourselves, it will not be acceptable and permissible to make money off of that as well. But again, uh, how do we deal with people who follow different of opinion? I think it's very, very, very important that we use hikmah and wisdom. Uh, you know, I'm always of the opinion, I request this to especially parents, uh, and individuals who have concern of concern for others as well, that imagine there is a tree, and if the tree begins to lose its leaf, or if the le if the if the leaves are not green anymore, they are not lush anymore, or the tree is not giving fruits anymore, what what does any intelligent individual do? They take water. They take fertilizer and they put it in this in the roots of the tree. So the entire tree is strong. It's 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 it flourishes, it nourishes, and it provides you know uh, the right and appropriate fruits and covering and shades for individual. And no one is going to go and put the water on the branches itself. So it's very important that once the in you know the love of Allah is created in the hearts of people then the commands of Allah become easy to follow as well. And this might be a little difficult to understand, but I think it's important concept to understand that the respect of Amr, Amr in Arabic means an order, will only be according to the respect and, and honor of the Amr, of the one who gave that order, right? We will only respect a certain order when we know the ability and the strength of the one giving that order. Otherwise, it's just going to be a statement. It's just going to be an announcement. Uh, you know, so Amr is accepted and respected and practiced according to the respect of the Amir, the one who has given that command. And that's why when we look at the life of Luqman, the wise, or Hakim Luqman in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the chapter in Surah Luqman, we initially see that Luqman the wise instilled within his child, within his generation, the love of Allah, the understanding of who Allah is. And then rest of the commands became very easy for them to absorb and partake in their lives. And even if we were to say something is makru, and, 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 and forgive me, I think this is going to be a little harsh, but I think we need it. I think I need it first and foremost. A lot of time we say, oh, it's not haram. It's, it's makru. People say, oh, it's makru. Makru means disliked. I always feel that pro try to put this word makru or disliked in the context of its true definition. What does makru mean? 
Makru means something that is disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not by me, not by someone else, not by this random individual. Makru or dislike means an action, words, or thing that is disliked by the Almighty. So for example, if person A does something and he or she says, it's okay, uh, the worst thing, it's not haram, uh, only Allah doesn't like it. Meaning that's the true definition of makruh, right? So we really have to make sure that even if there is kirahiya and dislike in something, we need to move away from this to live a life of purity, brothers and sisters. And Allah's qasam, may Allah give us that true purity that with obedience of Allah is sakun of our lives, right? We have all means of comfort that we can ever imagine, we can ever think of. We have everything in our lives, but why is there is no sukoon and comfort and peace and blessings in the lives of individuals? Because there is a big component that is missing. And that component is the commands of Allah. Avoiding the disobedience. Avoiding the makruhat and dislike things that really, really give sukoon in our lives. So uh, I, know, I know that it does not justify, Sister Yusra, it does not justify to the question that you have asked. I have a small article that I'm going to share in the comment after I'm done to your question. Once you get a chance, please look into that article, read it, and 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 reflect over it. If you have any questions, then we will definitely be able to follow up more on the aspect of music and its reality and how it impacts uh, the lives of so many individuals. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, brother. Is there any update on Hajj for this year? I have been anxiously anxiously asking uh the hajj group uh, and the people who are taking the groups subhanallah i've been creating an entire list of my friends brothers and sisters who have asked me that they would like to go this year i'm also asking allah that he takes us but there has no not been any updates if there is anyone who knows any updates please do share with us here but i, I have been continuously in touch with those who take hajj groups but there has not been any updates from the hajj ministry inshallah 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 as soon as something comes up will be the uh, the first ones to know, inshallah, in our community to make those announcements, inshallah. So Shayla Ahmed asks, Salam, what are some supplications would you recommend in this blessed month of Rajab? Also, what are the do's and the don'ts in this month? Amazing. Thank you. Beautiful question. So with regards to supplication that I would recommend, not specifically that there is any specific, uh, uh, you know, dua uh, with regards to this, but there is a, a, a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa which has been reported by Musannif ibn Abi Shayba. And some of the commentators have mentioned this hadith to be weak, da'if. But Imam Nawawi rahmatullahi, the author of Riyadh al-Salihin and many of the other books have mentioned that it is sound enough to be narrated and practiced. Uh, the famous dua and supplication in the beginning of Rajab is Allahumma barik lana fi Rajab wa Sha'ban wa balikna Ramadan. Oh Allah, give us barakah and blessings in the month of Rajab and Sha'ban and allow us to reach the month of Ramadan. Generally, when we talk about supplications in this month, sister, when you asked what you recommend, uh, what some of some supplications, I would say supplications with regards to istiqamat, which is steadfastness, uh, you know, with regards to, uh, you know, learning the value of the time that Allah has given us. I would say that the month of Ramad, uh, Rajab itself is one of the best times to uh, cultivate uh, certain habits into your lives. Uh, as Imam Rajab, humbly rahmatullah said, the month of Rajab is to cultivate, the month of Sha'ban is to irrigate, and the month of Ramadan is to reap the fruits and the reapers are the believers, meaning the ones who take the fruit itself. So this is really a month where you break away from the things and habits that you had created or I had created for such a long period of time. So imagine there's a fan in your room and the fan is moving. And when you turn off the switch or you unplug the fan, it doesn't stop right away. It takes a few seconds for it to stop. A lot of time we try to unplug that fan in the beginning of Ramadan but it keeps on moving and it gets plugged back on. So if you unplug it a little bit earlier, it will take some time, but the fan will stop 
And then, of course, you have a few moments for it to be completely stopped before it starts moving again. So it's very important that we begin now in, in creating those habits that we would like to have in the month of Ramadan. So, for example, of course, inshallah, we'll be fasting in Ramadan every day. But start your fasts Mondays and Thursdays. Maybe the white days, Ayamul Bees, 13, 14, and 15. Create the habit of sadaqa and charity. Create the habit of helping someone. Create the habit of, uh, you know, reading Quran, reading a little bit about the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And a lot of time there are there are misconceptions in this particular month where a lot of people commemorate Rajab as the month where they cook specific type of foods. In the South Asian community, they say kunde, uh, they cook this halim and other stuff and they give and they consider this to be ibadah, right? Uh, it's it's great. Feed people, provide people. Rasulullah Sallallahu when he came to Medina, amongst the first thing he said, Afshu salam, spread salam, spread peace, spread love. Feed people, give people, provide others. You know, haram, join your blood ties in your relationship and pray in the middle of the night and enter Jannah. So feeding people is amazing. But to consider this as an ibadah, something specific to be done on a specific night in Rajab and with a specific type of bread and food, that is not considered our deen. Anything that we specify as deen, which our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the companions never did, we cannot label this as deen. It may be a good habit that you can do by feeding others, but to saying that to say that this is a part of our deen, our religion, that would not be accepted. So some of the don'ts is there's no specific time of giving food of a specific type and a specific bread. A lot of time people consider the month of Rajab to be the, the month of Al-Asra wal Mi'raj. The ascension of the Prophet Sallallahu towards the heavens. Of course, it was the most miraculous journey that ever happened, uh, you know, in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu where he went to meet Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But if you look at the journey of Mi'raj, if it occurred a year or two before his Hijra, meaning migration towards Medina, that means that he stayed in this world for almost 12, 13 years after this journey. And never in his entire life, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the companions commemorated or celebrated Shabi Mi'raj or the night that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So adding on to what our deen has already given is something that we need to be careful from. Our deen is beautiful, brothers and sisters. Our Nabi's life is so beautiful. We don't have to add external components to make it more beautiful. We don't have to add external components to make it attractive because the way it is, it is just so beautiful by Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's Allah's command in the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So one of the things that we find from the authentic traditions from the Quran itself is that the month of Rajab from the Hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu is Ashur al Huram. It's a sacred month. Sacred months mean that the nobility of actions are increased and the severity of the sins are also increased. So increase yourself in good deeds, protect yourself from wrong. It is also a month that gives us the close uh, you know, uh, understanding or the uh, visual of the month of Ramadan being in front of us. So these are some of the things that we can practice. And of course, amongst the kitabs and the books, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajmain would begin to prepare themselves for the month of Ramadan with fasting, with sadaqah, with Quran and the other actions. All of these are things that inshallah we can do during this month. Assalamu alaikum. Can you help explain if a shower is an alternative for wudu? Also, can you maybe tell us how ghusl is different from a shower? Thank you so much. What a beautiful question, my brother. So when we talk about uh, ghusl or shower, let's talk about that first. Then we'll go back to wudu itself. So shower would just be the English portion of a ghusl. But ghusl is an Arabic term that is usually referred to cl cleansing of an individual's body after a major impurity or a person might be in a major state of impurity. So let me try to break this. This is like fiqh or jurisprudence 101. So there might be, just to put it in a very simple and easy way, because we have kids as well who are joining us. 
So there are two types of impurities. One is a minor impurity, one is a major impurity. Minor impurities means a person did number one or number two, uh, you know, blood came out, a person bled or something. And, and all of these are, uh, you know, impurities that are known as minor impurities. In order to purify ourselves from these minor impurities, we perform wudu so that we can perform our prayers, our supplications, our Quran, enter the Kaaba, uh, you know, pray our prayers, hold the Quran. All of this is required from the major, minor impurities. Then there are certain things that are known as the major impurities. Major impurities means that for our, our the female, after going through uh, monthly periods of, of, of impurity, once they become pure, or after the consummation of marriages or the partners meeting together in a sense of impurity, uh, that it, after that, uh, a person in this particular case falls into the state of major impurity. And in order to cleanse yourself from that major impurity, you would need to perform a shower, which is in Arabic terms, ghusl, which means that there has to have certain conditions in that shower. There are three things that must be done in order for a person to have completed their ghusl, which is the Islamic sense of complete purity. Number one thing is that if you are not fasting, meaning if it's not the month of Ramadan, and if you are not fasting, then you gargle the water to you to the extent that you feel the water in your throat. So not only just rinsing the water, but to gargle the water. That's number one. Number two, to put water in the nose that it reaches the soft bone or the soft part of the bone where it feels like, oh, you're going to drown, right? So you put the water and you sniff it a little bit to the time amount that it reaches the soft portion of your bone. That's number two. And number three, you put the water on your entire body that not even a single hair remains dry. And that's for both brothers or sisters. If you are in a major state of impurity and you have to perform your ibadah, you have to pray your salah, you have to read the Quran, and for those who have to enter the Baytullah, the Kaaba, all the places where you need to have wudu or impurity as part of the condition, and you are in a major state of impurity, you must perform a shower with three things, which makes it an Arabic form of word known as ghusl. Ghusl means just like shower, but with specific you know, actions. And the three things quickly, just as a, as a reminder that I don't forget, <clears throat> and you don't forget, number one, to gargle the water if you're not fasting and if it's not the month of Ramadan during the day uh, and if you're not fasting but if you are fasting you can just you know rinse your mouth and that's it uh, but if you are not if you're fasting then you rinse your mouth if you're not fasting you gargle number one number two the water in the soft portion of your nose and number three the entire body has to be and this has to be done once that's fault and the entire body has to be drenched with water that not even a single here remains that once that's complete your ghusl is complete if you have performed your ghusl with those three components, then you don't have to do wudu. So uh, can you can you explain if shower is an alternative? So if you have done a shower or ghusl, then you don't actually have to make wudu at that time. So if you're in the need of, of ghusl and you perform this with these three components, then you don't have to perform your wudu. If you were not in the need of a major impurity or cleansing yourself, you are just taking a shower to relax and of course cleanse yourself. In that case, even if you don't do those three conditions, but as long as your entire body becomes wet and no place is dry, then your wudu is complete. But the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sunnah was that whenever he would take a ghusl or a shower, the Nabi of Allah Sallallahu would in the beginning uh, use the restroom, meaning cleanse himself, relieve himself, clean the impurities off of his body, number two. Number three, he would perform the wudu prior to performing his ghusl shower, and then he would perform his ghusl, he would perform a shower. But of course, if someone doesn't perform their, their wudu before that and just perform a shower or ghusl, that would be enough for them to become pure and of course uh, perform their ibadat.
insha'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum. I want to remove all images with faces from my home and want to know from what extent. Do I remove DVDs and books with faces, serial boxes with faces on them? May Allah reward you and bless you. This is definitely a task, right? I, I think it's become more common than ever now. You know, being a child who who grew up here, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, my parents are very particular about this exact uh, same thing. But as as now I'm being a father myself, I find it to be so, so difficult now that everything has faces on it, right? You mentioned cereal boxes. Yes, my kids, one of my kids, mashallah, every child has their own flavors, but one of the kids love cinnamon toast crunch. And now with even the cinnamon, actually a little toast crunch has a face on the box. So it's 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 sometimes becomes so difficult. Allah is kareem and Allah knows our intentions, that, you know, how difficult it is. Uh, but as you mentioned that you want to remove as many images as you can, as from the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, that the house with images and, and other dogs uh, will be deprived of the rahmah and the mercy. So uh, you're doing your best as you can, you know. So uh, I, I would suggest do whatever is as much as possible, as feasible as possible. You know, and I'm telling you as an individual, I, I, I wouldn't want to say something that I wouldn't do, uh, you know, there comes a time I have I have toys in my in my house with my own kids, and it becomes almost impossible to find toys without any faces anymore. So uh, the most that uh, I get to do, or or my parents, my wife, is that you know in certain nights or certain sacred moments, we try our best to just put them in a place and cover them up properly. At least we show from our own side that yeah, Allah, we're trying, we're doing our best uh, to make sure that we can avoid them as much as we can. So. Try your best. It is Allah who gives us the himma, the strength, the courage. There are many people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I know personally, local here, mashallah, Allah has given them taqwa, Allah has given them piety. And, and they follow these commands and, and they're doing amazing. Uh, but yes, not to an extent uh, <clears throat> that it's, it's, you know, try your best. Seek Allah's help and assistance. Uh, and Allah is kareem at the end of the day. He knows our intentions and, and he is the best of the doers. Uh, may Allah make it easy for you and give me and all of us strength to do the right thing, inshallah. Uh, Dr. Sabda Jada, assalamu alaykum to you. Tisab and all the viewers, wa alaykum salam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to you and everyone, uh, uh, you as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you and bless you, Dr. Sab, for your guidance, uh, for your leadership and for your presence at all time. Uh, you're indeed an inspiration for so many of us. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Farhan. In many cultures in Egypt, India, Pakistan, etc., at, re at religious functions such as nikah, the use of drums and singing is always present. What are your views on the drums and singing? It is permissible in the eyes of the Almighty. So my thing is, let's go back to the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Let's go back to the time of Sahaba radiyallahu anhum ajma'in by the Iqbal. A lot of time, these things are very cultural. These are very, very, uh, you know, I, we were just talking to some of the scholars a few days ago that, you know, uh, the grooms cannot enter homes till they don't pay specific amount of money. Their shoes are taken. They're taking milk for money. I don't know. There are so many ways and cultures. You know, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said the best of the weddings are those where the expense is the least. You know, uh, we have made, and, and forgive me, this is a tangent to your question. We have made marriages so difficult now that forgive me for saying this, that adultery, fornication, and haram has become easy for people. We have made marriages so hard for people, right? With homes, with families, with children, with seeing the things around us. It, it has become so hard that haram has become so easy for individuals that rather than getting involved in something halal there in haram itself. So we actually have to set the rules. And I, you know, with regards to the drums and all that, uh, there is a clear prohibition of the Prophet ﷺ with regards to these actions. And a lot of time, and, and I know it may be a little harsh, but this is the reality that we do a lot of things. And forgive me, I say we, I talk about myself. Uh, we do a lot of things just so that people will be happy. Not realizing if my Allah will be happy. You know, there's a hadith of Rasulullah which says that, oh, oh, my slave, there is one thing that you desire. And oh, oh my slave, there is there is one thing that I desire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. And if you put your desire under my desire, Allah says, 
I, I will fulfill your desires and I will give you the best. And if you do not fulfill what I want, then Allah says, I will make you tired in your desires. And only that will happen which Allah wants. So a lot of time I feel myself. I'm not saying any one of you. I'm saying myself. We spend the entire life just spending how others can be happy with us or pleased with us. Yes, we need to keep good relationships. Never wondering if my Allah will be happy with my decisions or not. So I think it's very important that we focus in our lives and our actions to see what my Allah wants from me or your Allah and our Allah, right? Forgive me, I always say my Allah. This is my 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 mistake. Uh, I, I love the word Rabbi, my Rabb, my Rabb. Rasulullah used to say this very often. But one of my dear mentors who usually listens to us says that when you say my Rabb, my Lord, it feels like he's not ours. So I would say all of our Rabb. All of our Allah loves us. All of our Allah loves us more than any one of us. Is loved by anyone else. So I think it's very important that we set the rules, we set the guidance to the principles of our deen. So with regards to duff, which is not two-sided drums, there are certain narrations in some of the books and traditions where some have mentioned some acceptability, permissibility. But again, to avoid everything and anything that which even creates doubt, towards things which are completely away from doubt is 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 the protection of our deen. And this is something that we should all try towards, inshallah. Uh, Sister Zohra asks the question, Assalamu alaikum, brother, are shrimps makru? So that's a very difficult question, even though uh, it seems to be a very easy and simple question. But because the scholars have differed so much. So according to Imam Mashafi, rahmatullahi and the other schools, uh, it is completely acceptable and com completely permissible that anything that comes from the sea would be acceptable. According to Abu Hanifa, anhu, everything and anything that is considered to be a fish is considered to be halal and permissible. <coughs> and anything that is not considered to be fish, such as breathing from gills and other characteristics of a fish, it will not be acceptable. So... You know, some of the great Hanafi scholars, uh, you know, as some of you might know these names, Sheikh uh, Ashraf Ali Tanwi in his kitab, Bihishti uh, Zevar and others have written it to be acceptable. You know, I remember my own ustads, uh, the giant and the greatest uh, scholar of our time, may Allah preserve him and, of course, give him a long life, Sheikh Mufti Muhammad Taqi Usmani, Sahib Damat Barakatuh, Mona Aliyah. Mufti Sahib had initially written a fatwa uh, that shrimps were makru uh, and disliked. So uh, Mufti Abdul Salam Saab, rahmatullahi, who is also a teacher of mine, uh, he used to be one of the greatest uh, teachers in muhaddith and faqih uh, who used to teach in Karachi. Then he moved back to Bangladesh. He was from Chattagam, Chittagam, uh, in, in Bangladesh in a madrasa called Hat Hazari. I actually traveled to Bangladesh just so that I can sit with him and get permission from him and get ijazah from him. And I was blessed and honored to actually uh, fly to, to Bangladesh when he was alive. He was year, I think it was year 2007, 2007 or eight. SubhanAllah, it's been a long time. And I went to him, I sat down in his company, got the ijazah and permission from him from Hadith. So he wrote a rebuttal for Sheikh Mufti Taqi Usmani's article saying that shrimp is makru. And he wrote an entire article with Dalil and Proof and others. And then Sheikh Mufti Muhammad Taqi Usmani, Damat uh, Barakatuhum, took back his fatwa and verdict with regards to shrimp being makru in the Hanafi school. And the final verdict, I think that they had written in Taqreed al tirmizi I know it's a more academic discussion, but, but just for your understanding, that the final verdict for the Hanafi school is that for those who look at shrimp and feel uncomfortable, for them, the kirahiya or dislike would remain. And for those who look at shrimp and they do not feel the kirahiya or the dislike of looking at it or the way it looks or feels or smells, in that case, it would be acceptable for them without kirahiya to consume. So according to Hanafi school, it will depend upon the judgment of an individual, but in large cases, it will not be considered makru. It will be acceptable for one to consume. Forgive me, it's a little bit more delicate and academic discussion, but it has a lot more detail. So I just scratch a little bit of surface for you, but there's a lot more, inshallah, to this. 
Brother Musa says, Assalamu alaikum, Mufti. How do you advise parents who do not approve of son's choice of spouse only because she is from a different part of their native country? Talking about tribalism in Desi Muslim culture. Oh man, subhanAllah. <clears throat> this is one of the biggest concerns that I find nowadays. Look, I get it. I get it. I, I, Alhamdulillah, I'm blessed to be able to be living with my parents as a child. I'm blessed to be a husband with, you know, Alhamdulillah, my amazing wife, spouse, and a father to my three children. And I, I know where you're coming from 100%. And I know where your parents are coming from as well. Not your parents, sorry. Parents in general, sorry, are coming from. <clears throat> a lot of time when we are living far away from, as, as people who are immigrants are living far away from homes, they want to make sure that everything is secure, tight knit. They, they, it's, it's, it's a lot that goes on from them because it's a melting pot for many of them. And they want to make sure that if they speak Punjabi, they have to make sure that their son-in-law or daughter-in-law has to speak Punjabi or they have to come. If they come from the Pashto background, they have to speak. I'm talking about just Pakistan or, 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 or even in Bangladesh. If they come from Silet, then the marriage proposal has to be Silet. They cannot be from Nawakhali and other places. India as well. All South or East and this and that. It's it's a messed up situation. Forgive me. Forgive me for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I, I completely agree. There's a huge benefit in having a sense of understanding. It makes sense, right? Because you're raised with a specific mindset, with a specific culture. Our parents, our mothers, our fathers were raised with a specific, and they would feel much more comfortable if someone came in and they brought in the same, you know, uh, understandings and bases and foundations, maybe same food and same culture and same feelings and, as I say, vibes that they had. But subhanAllah, this sometimes lead to a level that when they don't find that right match or criteria, they would start negating everything that comes in front of them, which means that any good choice, which may not fit the exact same tribal background, will completely be negated based upon this, right? And, and, and I've seen that this has led for many young people to make decisions which their parents regretted for the rest of their lives. Either they married into families which were not even the people of faith anymore, or they made decisions where they never even received the approvals of their elders. So I really feel that there has to be a drawn middle path to this. The adults, the parents have to come out from that cultural thinking because we live as an ummah. We came to this country for many of our parents and the children being raised and born here. Our identity here is Islam. Yes, culture is beautiful. I love the culture. It gives us food. It gives us language. It gives us adab. It gives us so much heritage. It's amazing. Culture is just so beautiful. But our bunyad, our foundation is our deen. I'm a Muslim, right? That's what our bunyad, our foundation, and our basis has to be. And for all of us who have made this dream for us to move to these country and, and the West to live here and to achieve all that we have, and now we still want that cultural stuff, we just need to change, brothers and sisters. We need to instill within ourselves the choice of Islam as the basis of identity. Yes, I agree where parents are coming from. Sometimes the differences are so much in the upbringing that they feel that the children will not fit. So it's not a blanket statement. I, you know, as, as a father, as a son, as a husband, I cannot give a blanket statement. But I would only request one thing for parents. Please do not make the bunyad of your tribes the basis of getting your children married. I know specific families in Pakistan, if you don't have that last name, your daughter or your son is not getting married anywhere else. Doesn't matter who the other person is. Doesn't matter how old they become. It doesn't matter you know, if they were to find the most pious individual as long as they don't have, it's not acceptable. And it's sad because there is no other reason, there is no other excuse just because what will the other relatives say that you, you 
married out of the tribe of so and so. Please, we need to come out of that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah sallam said marriage happens on the basis of four things. People marry on the basis of beauty. They only just look at the exteriors. Number two, people marry on basis of merit, of wealth, mal. Number three, people marry on the basis of tribe and lineage and families and names. And number four, Rasulullah said, as Muslims, they married on the basis of deen and taqwa. And Rasulullah said, make that your bunyad, make that your foundation. Make that as a base of your relationships. So for parents, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, I completely agree that culture has an amazing sense of feeling of connection. And I, you know, don't disagree with you on that matter as well. But please, for the sake of Allah, do not make that as a bunyad, as a foundation for your absolute judgments. Number two, kids, youngsters, your parents are not wrong. Right. Forgive me for saying this, but one wise individual that I, I'm inspired by so much, they told me that kids only look at the color of their dad and their mom's skin. They don't look at their own colors. The only thing that their mom and dad are brown. They don't think their own selves. Right. So you as an individual, as a person, need to also understand that your parents are looking for the best for you and always make sure that, that uh, you know, not everything that your parents want from you is something that is being forced upon you. So there has to be a middle ground, right? Sometimes these cultural connections, which in Islam is known as kufu, are great to be matched. Rasulullah matched Zayd radiallahu. The only individual mentioned in the Quran is Zayd, who was the so-called adopted son. He was not adopted, but he was gifted to him, he kept him, and then they called him Zayd bin Muhammad, and the Quran says don't call him by the name like that. He's Zayd and, this, and, 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 and not the son of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So Rasulullah married Zayd radiallahu anhu to his cousin, Zainab radiallahu anhu. Zayd radiallahu anhu came from a background where his father and his uncles were really rich people, but his title was because he was sort of enslaved and he came into freedom. So there was a little bit of baggage with him on that side. Zainab radiallahu anha on the other side, she came from the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu family. She, she came from this high, you know, level, big time family. And the relationship didn't work out well, right? The, the relationship did not work out well. So what ended up happening was that subhanAllah, the Quran talks about the separation of Zayd radiallahu anhu and subhanAllah, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and Zainab radiallahu anha. So kufu, a proper match is also important. A match in a sense of, as they say, khandan, the value, the family, all of that really needs to also match up as well. And don't get me wrong uh, in that sense that it has to be the same last name or the same, you know, family, but it has to hold a lot of value. So please make sure that it's decided through votes. This is something I can talk about forever. Uh, Brother Musa, thank you for your question. I hope this answers a little bit, but I could talk about this forever. And you must have heard I was too passionate about this as well, subhanAllah. But we need to talk about this. Brother John Adams says, Salam, is making dua and wiping my hand over my face after every obligatory prayer bid'ah. So bid'ah in Arabic means something that we constitute as a part of our deen and our religion. If a person makes the dua after every fard salah and wipes it over their faces, considering this to be a part of your salah and your salah not being complete, then it's bida and it's an, it's an innovation. But if a person is making dua just because they want to make dua and they want to make sure that they show this as a means of, of their desire and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's perfectly fine. But to wipe over the faces and others, there is no nothing specific like that. But making dua uh, after every fard salah is not mandatory. It's not compulsory. And in a lot of places, people don't move. Or the imams make sure that you sit down and you make that dua. Otherwise, they will say your salah is not complete. That's wrong. That's bidah. That's innovation. There are certain people who completely avoid dua. And they would do that, you know, forcefully just so that no one makes that dua, that's also a wrong thing. Rasulullah says two times the dua are the most accepted in the middle of the night, last third of the night. And secondly, the time after the fard salah, 
dua is accepted. So it's important that we make that. How about congressional dua after prayer? I have heard scholars say that it is not from the prophetic tradition. No. To make the dua collectively after every first salah, it is not from amongst the prophetic tradition. Rasulullah on a very collective level did not make the dua. Yes, there were times, there were moments that Rasulullah did make dua. The Sahaba did say Amin upon them, and there were moments in Sahaba as well. But to make it after every congressional salah, every after every fal salah, it's not proven. Sometimes you can make it loud. Sometimes you make it collectively with the Imam. Sometimes you just walk away. Sometimes you make it yourself individually. So you're correct in that sense that there is nothing continuously from the life of the Prophet ﷺ in that specific way. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Can you please show how to do tayammum? Also with one hand, if not able to use both. And also, can tayammum be performed with shoes on? Good, great question. So tayammum is the portion or the way of performing uh, cleanliness or purity when one is unable to use water, such as water is not available, a mile distance. Water, if used on your body, will make you sick. In such sickness that may Allah forgive, a person may die or become so sick that they won't be able to perform ibadah or virtue any, uh, actions anymore. Or there is a wound, or or there is such a you know pain, or such a cast, or something where you're not able to perform the wudu or touch your skin with the water, then you can perform tayammum. Tayammum has three conditions, but there are three things that are condition of tayammum. Number one condition is niyat. The first thing is to make niya. Make niya that you want to perform tayammum to either perform wudu or even to do ghusl. Sometimes you're not able to take a shower. So you can also do tayammum to perform ghusl, meaning your farz ghusl as well. But depending that all the conditions are met. So you can't just do that because it's like 20 degrees outside. Tomorrow morning, everyone doing tayammum at home. No, that's not acceptable. It's just because cold. No. Alhamdulillah, we got to do wudu and we got to make sure that we perform wudu with water. But when you fit the criteria and condition, then three things in tayammum. Number one, niyat and intention of, of, of tahara, purity. Tayammum. I make niyat of performing tayammum to perform wudu. Number one. Number two, you have to tap your hand on something that comes from earth. Meaning, what does it mean, earth? It doesn't have to be dirt. It doesn't have to be sand. It doesn't have to be something like purely like that. Anything that if you burn should not melt away, like a rock. A rock may not directly have dirt on it, but you can perform tayammum on it. So maybe you take a little stone from outside, from outside of your home, or you bring it inside if you're not able to perform and you tap your hand on it. If you can only use one arm, khair, that's fine. You tap on it. If you use both, you tap on it once. If the dirt is visible, you can remove some of it. You can remove some of it. If if it's if it's uh, not there, if it's not a lot, the first thing you have to do is to take from the top of your face and all the way towards the bottom. Meaning, you just got to get your entire face wiped once from the beginning to the, the top. That's one. That's number two thing. So number one is niyat, intention, that you want to perform tayammum for, for, for purity. Number two, you tap the ground or you trap, tap the place which has the dirt and you wipe your face once. That's And if you cannot do it with, 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 with two hands, according to your question, if someone's wrist or something is, is not functioning, so you just tap it with one hand and then you wipe your face completely with one hand. Allah is kareem, right? Subhanallah. So much ways. Then you tap the ground or whatever it is once. And you wipe over your right arm once. And then with your right hand, wipe over your left arm towards your elbow. If you can't use one of your arms and you can only use once, then the back or any portion of your hand used to wipe over, and the other hand, you can wipe over. So that there are only three things to do, basically. Number one, make niya and intention of tahara. Number two, tap the ground and wipe your face once. Number three, tap the ground or whatever it is, and wipe over both of your hands. First, your right hand with your left hand once up to the elbow, that no place should remain without being touched. And then your right hand, using uh, using your right hand <clears throat> and going around over your left arm up to the elbow. If you cannot use one of your arms, then use the other arm 
to do this hand and the other hand, use any portion of your hand or your wrist or any place to do as much as you can. And the rest can be left in Allah's kareem. May Allah accept your ibadah and your prayers, inshallah, in that very people. Assalamu alaikum, Mufti Saab. Who are the people that following Zabur? Oh, Torah, Zabur. Uh, I will look into this. Definitely, it's an interesting question. Uh, who are the people who are following? Are they still present? Are they not still present? That, that, is, that is a very interesting question, inshallah. I, I will definitely look into it. So what is the opinion about lobster? It's two, it's from the ocean. Yes. So according to Imam al-Shafi, rahimahullah ta'ala, anhu, the usage or the uh, eating of the lobster is completely acceptable and permissible. And it is allowed according to Imam al-Shafi, rahmatullahi, and the other schools. Um, according to Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, anhu, because of the Hanafi school only allows the consumption of anything that comes from the water, which comes from the family of fish, which means it should have gills that should be breathing from. And that's why it is not considered to be permissible, which some scholars have mentioned to have kirahiya in lobster, of course, would not be haram. But according to Hanafi, it will be uh, not acceptable. Uh, but according to Imam Shafir, it would be acceptable because of anything that comes from the ocean or the water would be acceptable because it does not have flowing uh, 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 blood. Uh, and that would be acceptable from the hadith of Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our deeds, our actions. Forgive me, brothers and sisters, we almost took an hour of your time, but it is always good to see your brothers and sisters' participation. May Allah make this as a means of khair for all of us. Give us istiqamat and steadfastness. Allow us to follow Sarat al-Mustaqeem and always keep us upon haq and truth. Give us the strength to follow the truth. May Allah protect us from wrong and haram and raise us amongst the righteous on the day of Qiyamah. See you next week. Assalamu alaikum. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.